This podcast is part of the Big Heads Media Podcast Network. Go to BigHeadsMedia.com for more great podcasts. Welcome to the Clock and Talk, an Arsenal podcast. Thank you for listening. Thank you for downloading. You get me at Gunatez, and I am your host, as I am every each and every fucking week. Um, I got to give a shout out to our good people in France this week because I've looked at your stats, and I am blown away. And thank you to you, good people in France, because we are actually number seven on the iTunes charts in on the football podcast in France. So thank you, you guys. Um, I'm joined with. By Tony. Tony, you can get you at Clock and Talk. How are you, buddy? Clock and underscore talk. Um, just for future reference, I'd like to be introduced as the world's best podcaster. Um, so oh, not just by so. name. That would be great uh, <laughs> because we have received tweets this week t- saying that I am the world's premier podcaster. But yeah, I'm good. Thanks. <laughs> Don't even get me started. Uh, Schwinn, you're with us, mate. IFC Schwinn, you can get uh-huh. him at. <laughs> <laughs> I'm good. I was going to sit in my dick as well, but I think Tony's done that for the three of us combined. So let's get on with it. <laughs> uh, we're going to pump this out very quickly, so it won't be a usual two-hour podcast because Tony's got places to be, I've got places to be, and Schwinn's just sitting on the lounge doing absolutely nothing. So, um, Okay, Burnley, Tony, thoughts on that lineup, mate, when it came out? Yeah, I think maybe not starting Pepe was probably the only surprise I mean I, I probably thought he would start Chambers over Louise but it was a sort of bit of a 50-50 one um, so I, I wouldn't have been amazed either way um, the only one that's really surprised me was Nelson and, and what surprised me more is that uh, if it wasn't going to be Pepe I probably I would have thought Emery would have picked Mkhitaryan I know Nelson was better last week but Emery tends to favour experience been there and done it um, so that that was uh a bit of a surprise. I'm not saying it was bad. It was just uh, I was a bit surprised. And Schwinn, your thoughts, buddy? Similar. Um, I think I expected Luis to come in. I think that's what I said last week when we did the show. And similarly, uh, I didn't quite expect Toretta to feature uh, from the beginning. So on that account, I was correct. But yeah, Pepe. I'm, I'm, I'm guessing he's not going to start this coming weekend either against Liverpool. If you know he still doesn't have more than what 30, 40 minutes under his belt. Uh, in a particular game, so it's 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 interesting to see how we're going to proceed. Of course, we're going to talk about that, but coming into the game, I was quite happy with the lineup. My only one, boys, uh, Socrates over Chambers. I don't know. Though I think there's a few questions as well as to why we we might as well touch on that now. If you want, Tony, um, that was my only shock. Well, no, not for me. For me, it was always going to be Socrates plus one other, and it was either going to be Chambers or Louise. And as I said, I, I probably expected Chambers. Uh, I believe that's what I said when we done our predicted lineups last week or whenever we've done it. But I don't think it's a shock. Um, if he feels that they're the two strongest and most experienced going forward, then obviously he had to bed them in at some point. Also, I think we touched on this before. with Without Xhaka... There was no one that was really going to play the progressive, the more direct balls, the longer balls. And, and Louise is, is great at that. So maybe if we saw Xhaka, we might not have seen Louise and we might have seen Chambers. But I thought without Xhaka in the team, it probably was pretty nailed on that, that Louise was going to play to try and get the ball forward quicker. Mm, OK. Um, Schwinn, first 20 minutes, mate. And well, we've got a goal there as well. Lacazette in the 13th minute, mate. Yeah, Lacazette did get a goal, and he did very, very well to get that goal. You know, showed great strength, and uh, somehow just managed to slot it in. But I'm not quite sure if that was the story of the first 20 minutes. You know, Burnley came to play, 
they pressed high, they showed good energy in the beginning of the game, and that's sort of what cost them, I think, towards the end. But it was a bit nervy, you know. Uh, we tried to play out from the back. I, I should say that we have become better at it. It's still not great, but we have become much better at it. And, you know, th- there are moments when we lose the ball, we're quick to react. Ceballos, in particular, was very quick to react every time he lost the ball throughout the game. And, you know, that energy in midfield helped. Uh, at the same time, we had, you know, players like David Luiz who were sort of playing with fire and, you know, playing passes right across the face of the goal, which just needed a touch to to be finished. But, you know, it showed that the team was was calm and was willing to play the way Emery has, has you know, spent most of last season and, of course, this preseason. Uh, th- there were instances where, you know, I, I feared that we might concede. Burnley was quick to hop onto those second chances and it seemed like there was a player always free on the far post for them. But we did well not to concede. And as you said, as Lacazette did very well to get us that quick lead. Tony, going from there, from about the 20th minute to the uh, end of the first half, uh, look, we'll take us through that whole first half, if you like, um, and then leading up to Ashley Barnes managing to get a goal against us. Yeah, I mean, I felt like we were on the front foot. I've seen a lot of people moaning about our playing out from the back, and I thought it was OK yesterday. I don't think there's any real issues. Um, we we didn't really get caught stupidly. We may have lost the ball in and around the halfway line, but that, that's two or three passes further on. Um, I thought yesterday it probably worked better than it has done a lot of times. And that the Gwendozi chance where he, he shot low and Pope saved it uh, came from playing out from the back and playing in tight spaces. Yes, it was nervy, and you thought if they lose the ball, we're here here we're in trouble. But then I guess you have to back these guys are top players, and you have to back them to not lose the ball in them situations. Otherwise, you just then they'll never take the ball anywhere if you think they're going to lose it at all times. Um, Burnley, I thought Burnley played quite well. I mean, there's been a lot of criticism of them, especially after Dyche came out uh, after the game and moaned about diving, and, and they did play a lot of long balls. But that's what you're going to get from Burnley. They're always going to make you battle. They're they're going to be in your face. They're going to give you a game. They're not going to just sit there and let you have 90% of possession without putting in tackles. So it was the game was pretty much as expected. Their goal for me was a bit unlucky. Obviously, the ball deflected straight to Barnes. I've seen people blaming various people, Socrates, Luis, Ceballos. But for me, it's just purely unlucky. Ceballos has showed um, Neil on to eat, uh, inside because he's completely one footed. Maybe let him go a bit too easy, but nothing drastic. Then the shot's taken a huge deflection. There's no way that Luis could possibly pick up on that. And it's fallen right to Ashley Barnes. I think it's a bit unlucky, but I can't say it wasn't coming. They they were in the game. I don't think, I was saying to Schwinn last night, I don't think they made many chances, but they were always in the game. I, I'm not I'm not hanging him out to dry because I did mention it in the WhatsApp group uh, with uh, Socrates. And look, my only problem was, is you know how they run, you know, well, you see him run and he's, he tries, I hate how they turn their back and try and do the intercept thing. I, look, and it's, it's no, I'm not blaming him, but I like, I would prefer a defender to come in and tackle hard. If you miss it, you, you know, if you miss the ball, you miss it and, and so be it. But that, that was probably my only little gripe. I'm not, I'm not hanging him out to dry or anything, but I just like my defenders to, to tackle hard and, 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 yeah, that's, I hate it. You know, he turned his back and the deflection then come, you know, come on to him and then it went over to Barnes. Um, yeah, that, that, like I said, that's only my only I, I can't see any fault, personally. He got the block and he went to block the ball. He, he went to block, block it, it. He has yeah. no control over where it goes. Like, if, if, if you're expecting a player to block it and then it go pinpoint to someone, that's never going to happen. Yeah, so I, I, just, I just prefer to block him, full tackle, done. that's all, yeah. I just prefer him run up. Away. It, wasn't, it wasn't in tackling distance. It wasn't like McNeil was right in front of him. Otherwise, the deflection wouldn't have gone there. I, mm. I, I don't know what more he could have done. For me, there's no blame at all. I, I don't blame anyone. I, I think it's just one of them things. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, we're going to half time. Uh, obviously, 1-1 one, one up. Thoughts then, Schwinn, because Nelson went off and then Pepe came on. He did. I mean, just before uh, we went into for halftime, Nelson, of course, had that opportunity that was correctly ruled offside. Uh, and I think that was probably his brightest moment uh, during the game. He, of course, contributed very well to playing out from the back and was tidy uh, yesterday. But 
when you look at the final third, I don't think he was very effective. So the substitution made sense. And of course, this was the first, you know, proper glimpse we got to see of Pepe. 45 minutes, got to see combination plays, got to see him defend when we didn't have the ball or whatever little defending he did. Uh, bright debut, you know, like not debut, but bright appearance, I'd say. Enjoyed watching him, got to see his tendencies. Uh, he's not afraid to take players on, something we've lacked for a long time. Very happy to hugging, you know, and hugging the touch touch line. Happy to come inside and, and spray the ball wide, and of course some of the combination plays that we uh, that we saw him undertake. Uh, also very very good on the half turn. You know, the, we've all seen that one gif going around on the internet um, that that saw him, you know, just completely leave two players in the dust. So bright uh, should have done better in slotting in Aubameyang at the very end when there was a two on one. I think he just left it. You know, a bit too uh, weak at, at the at the very end, but I enjoyed watching him, and I'm interested to see whether he's going to start next weekend. Who was it that he made look like a complete fool again? Um, Tarkowski was it? Oh no, Ben Mee. Yeah, <laughs> it wasn't that good. <laughs> the glimpses of that, it's good to see. You know, I know he's not fully fit and. Yeah, I I seen the one one or two people saying us and, and not Arsenal fans, more so Tottenham fans and whatnot saying that um oh look seventy five million for a bloke who what did he do? But mate, they're just fucking moaning and cunts as far as I'm concerned. Because I, I thought I'd look I liked what I seen. There was glimpses of brilliance there and I think I think we're in for a good season out of him, boys. Uh I mean yeah. I thought he was I thought he was very bright. I think Aubameyang should have scored the chance that Pepe put him in for, not the one Shrin's talking about. Yeah, the other yeah, one where later. Yeah. Also, um, that the ball to Aubameyang was a bit short, but Aubameyang should have done a hell of a lot better. He was trying to look to give it back. That there was a few instances yesterday where they was just trying to look to get Pepe in, just that rather too than much do move, eh? better for the team. Like if Aubameyang, the ball was under here. I'm not saying it was perfect, but if Aubameyang just takes that and runs straight towards goal, no one catches him and he gets in and, and should score. It would have been one on one, but he was almost looking for the return ball before he got the ball, which slowed him down. And then the pass was under here, so it was like two. They were slowing themselves down in two ways. It, as I said, it could have been better. Um, on the, the the nutmeg on Ben Mee, it was class, but I preferred, and I've not seen a gif of it, I've seen the replays, uh, he played a little flick around the corner um, and it led to, I think, Torreira's chance where Pope made a, a worldie. Um, but it was like it was better interplay, whereas the, the Ben Mee one was all like self-brilliance. But he, I think he played a little flick around the corner to Maitland-Niles, who then spat, or Willock, who then beat the defender and cut it back and Torreira had a shot. But he, he had a, a nice few little glimpses uh, he did try a little Croy flick when he first came on and, I, and he completely missed the ball under pressure and stuff like that's a little bit annoying. So why I was done the exact same last week, but they both seem to have learned from that, that you can't take liberties in, in this league. Uh, Bemian gets a goal, Tony, 64th minute, assisted by the man, Sabayas. Man of the moment, Danny Sabayas. Uh, yeah, I mean, look, he won the ball. He lost the ball originally. And, and what you look for when, especially that type of player that's come from Spain and is pretty flary, what you look for when they lose the boys, are they interested in getting it back? Not can they, because they're not obviously going to be able to win every tackle, but are they actually interested to go and hunt for it? And he did, and he won it back. Uh, Aubameyang, obviously, for me, is horrendous defending. It's a great finish and a great run by Aubameyang. I'm not taking anything away from him at all. But if one of our defenders done that, I'd be fucking fuming. Tarkovsky's so scared of the pace outside he's just showing him inside like oh go on then go inside on your stronger foot and then it's kind of giving Pope no chance because Aubameyang's able to either bend it top corner in the other side or go to bottom corner he did on that side um, Aubameyang's done really well great finish great run he's done well to get inside but Tarkovsky gave that to him um, but thank you <laughs> I'll, I'll take it every day of the week <laughs> yeah exactly um uh... Schwin, look, there's a couple of substitutions. I thought towards that last, I don't want to put a negative spin on it because, look, we got the three points, but the Abembian goal, probably Tuera came on, Sabias went off. Did you boys think that last maybe 10 minutes we just felt like we were lacking a bit of fitness or they were, they were really coming home strong? Not really. I mean, for me, I think it was Emery trying to almost you know, look ahead to Liverpool. I think he was 
you know, sort of confident that this is this game is done and we won't concede. And I think that that sort of goes down to Luis and Socrates, who I think were very, very effective on the day. And I think that's the reason that Emery tried this back three, hence taking Ceballos off, you know, at some point putting Kolasinac on too. And I think that's an indication of what he might try or start with against Liverpool and Tottenham. So I, I don't necessarily pay a lot of attention to, you know, in terms of whether it was, you know, energy falling. I think we just had a couple more bodies stationed forward, a, a low block defense sort of emptied the midfield to an extent. And that's when Torreira was brought in because Emery, I think, noticed that the midfield was very empty. So he added that one player in the center of the park. But I, I, I liked what Emery did with those subs. You know, it's you can you can see the 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 train of thought now as opposed to last season. And there's a proper pattern. Uh, he's easing players back into the fray. We saw that with Kolasinac. We've seen that with Pepe over the past two weeks. And uh, there's there's definite you know a pattern in what he's following there for me. Mm-hmm. Um, so a couple of yellow cards, Tony Bemiang, that was the one He wasn't 10 metres back on a free kick I'm pretty sure yellow yeah. card at 38th so That was Mike Dean trying to be the star of the show again He can't blow the whistle and then when the ball's kicked It's not like Aubameyang was standing on the ball mm. That's just, I said this to my friends before the game that One of the issues with VAR is you're going to get refs like Mike Dean Who can't be the centre of attention when the ball's in the area anymore Because they're going to get overruled and it's going to get looked at so now they're just doing it outside the area where they, they can be the star of the show. He gave, But both ways, I'm not saying Mike Dean was biased, but he gave free kicks both ways and, and yellow cards that were just never in a million. They were just stupid, but it's like, oh, look, it's all about me again. I mean, there was one on McNeil in the first half. It was right in front of me where he, he ran down the wing. There was no foul there. He didn't complain himself. Ended up like running towards the corner flag with nowhere really to go. Got boxed in. And Mike Dean's brought it back. But when he blew the whistle, even McNeil was a bit like, what? Like I'm running down the way. Not, not that he wanted the advantage. He thought that he'd given a foul against him. Like he didn't know what was going on. But again, it's, that's how Mike Dean and and certain other refs are going to deal with things now. Mm-hmm. Well, David Luiz, he had won the ninetieth you know, extra time. Yeah, he, he kicked the ball away. Uh, is that what it was? Oh, stupid. And Ashley Barnes got one right on the whistle. So. Yeah, arguing. Yeah. Um, Okay, so give us your three, two, one, Tony. Uh, we'll start with the three. Uh, oh, there's been no surprise in saying Danny Ceballos. Yep, and well, give us your thoughts on him for the day. Why were there? He he was unbelievable. I mean, it's the type of player you just love to watch. He gets you out of your seat with almost every touch. Uh, but there was a lot of things beyond that. Look, we all knew he had footballing ability, but the stuff I touched on earlier, where is he willing to try and win the ball back after he loses it? Is he willing to do the hard, gritty stuff? What's he going to be like when he gets kicked? Is he going to shy away? And all of that stuff he passed with flying colours yesterday. And then obviously the, the celebration after the second goal, like showing that, that he cares and that that should be a bare minimum, but it's not in football. So stuff like that. And I'm not saying that means he loves the club and he's going to be here forever and get it tattooed on his face. But just that want to win be it for us or whoever he's playing for is, is something that was nice to see. What was also good to see is quite early on in the first half, he got fouled and it was, it was a foul and the ref gave it, but it was nothing bad. And he stayed down sort of rolling around for a bit. And I can't remember if it was Louise or, or Socrates picked him up like straight away. They didn't even entertain. He might be injured, picked him up and they must've said to him, look, you've got a free kick, get the fuck up. Like, and after that, every other time he got fouled, he, he didn't stay down rolling around. And it's good like that. It shows that he's able able to learn quickly. You might disagree with him staying down early on, but once someone's told him that the rest not going to do anymore, they're not. You're not going to get a book in because you stayed down for five minutes. So just get up and get on with the game and and stuff like that was nice to see. I thought it was a really complete performance. The only, I guess I've got two. I'm not even saying they're negatives, but two slight issues. Uh, first one is if we've all got to remember Mkhitaryan's home debut was absolutely sensational as well so I'm not going to start writing Danny Ceballos as well a pair of the year just yet and the, the second one may be controversial I ain't giving him the assist for the first goal I'm, I'm not having two assists yesterday and look nothing that doesn't make his performance any worse but when you put a corner in which isn't the best and it bounces around off a few players and then Lacazette does un- unreal to turn and score while being fouled I think for me that devalues assist stats when stuff like that counts. And I know on official records it'll count, but 
you know what I mean there's levels of assistant for me that yeah was... no I, I, look I'm glad you brought that up actually because I was going to ask you boys about that um, what you thought of that so I'm glad you mentioned it um, so, uh, who were I up to Schwinn you're, you're th- three mate yeah got to be Danny Ceballos I mean on the day most touches most passes most passes in the opposition half most chances created most recoveries most fouls won most assists most duels won and uh, on par uh, you know for uh, most tackles and most take-ons and most shots so you can see that he was everywhere you know he was involved he he showed himself to teammates um, you know a, a consequence of playing out from the back means that you always need to have a teammate around you and i think more often than not it was him who was showing himself uh, as an option you know he's so tidy to get out of tight situations which can be a real asset you know in this style of play and we saw that yesterday He's also very clever the way he plays a ball. You know, uh, we often see either a ball is played to to feet, or you you thread a through, a through pass in behind uh, the last line of defense, uh, so that you know a, a quick player can get onto it. But what I noticed is Ceballos plays these through balls in midfield. You know, just and they're they're often just um, horizontal. They're not vertical passes. That, that are forward looking but it takes the pressure off and it allows a player to get on it uh, in stride and when you have players like Maitland Niles Willock who like to move and progress with the ball uh, it can really open up you know spaces for them to even advance five yards have a quick one two and, and keep going so very very integral yesterday especially in the first half I thought he was incredible I, our best player by a mile and I think these uh, these numbers sort of just underline all that no, totally agree, boys. I'm going with the three there. You'd be mad not to. Um, just one thing, look, everything for everything you boys have said is the, obviously the reason. Um, one thing that nobody did mention is that uh, when a Bemiang scored, the uh, Sabias, he was fucking pumped. And I like to see a bloke who's here on loan run over to the corner post. I'd imagine what it was like at the ground, Tony. But just he, just you could see the the... the the hype in the bloke, you know, he's like, fucking yeah, cunts, like, I've got, you know, like, uh, and I just love to see that from a player, that was really good, so, um, with him celebrating the Abemian goal. Uh, your two, Tony? I'm finding two and one quite difficult, because Sabayas is so head and shoulders above everyone else, you kind of, that's that's what you take away from the game, you just think, oh, Sabayas, Sabayas, Sabayas. Nah, that's hard. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, after... After I don't want to say hammering him last week, but after I gave it, I didn't rate him anywhere near as highly as everyone else last week. I thought Benduzi had a really good game yesterday. Uh, I think when you're playing with someone like Sabios, you you have someone has to do the other job, and and Gwenduzi's energy showed, and he just kept the ball ticking over. I think the only stat that from what I've heard that uh, Gwenduzi that Sabios didn't win was pass completion, and Gwenduzi won it. Which is the perfect foil for for the way Sabios played. So I'm going to give it to Gwenduzi, but I wouldn't. There's so many players that you couldn't argue just because Sabios was head and shoulders above everyone else. So anyone else on the pitch, I don't think there's many arguments. Yeah, no I think worries. We're going to be split up these the two and ones. Um, Schwinn. Uh, it's look. I, I don't want to disagree because it's Gwenduzi and he did really have a very good game. But for me, it's David Luiz. You know, comes into the team, slots in right away. Uh, you couldn't really tell that this is his first proper start for for a new club. You know, he formed a partnership with Socrates. There were there were moments when both of them would uh, close down Ashley Barnes, and there was sufficient communication for them to come out of it. Uh, you know, looking neat and tidy, played some good passes over the top. Uh, Aubameyang and Lacazette were constantly making those runs when Luis had the ball at his feet. And, of course, there were a couple of situations where, you know, he showed his bastardry, something that, you know, we missed recently and we only had with Socrates. So it's good to have two center backs who, you know, can have that side to them. And when you're playing a team like Burnley, which is obviously very physical, aggressive, they like to put a foot in, you need players like them who can, you know, sort of reciprocate that. And I thought uh, Luis did very well to to wear the shirt for the first time and just make it his own. Yeah, no, he gets my two as well, mate, and they're very similar reasons. And, you know, I love that little lot ball he put over to Aubameyang. And it just, I know it was little glimpses of things too, but that's what he does best. But not only that, you you could see him on corners and that. And I don't want to put the knives out for Mustafi, but you, you don't see... 
a Mustafi screaming at the players, get into position, get in, you know, and and really fucking passionate about that that defence. And I just felt that oh, look. I could be wrong, but I felt uh, like a leader was back on, like was back in our defence again. Um, I know we, you know, we've probably seen it in the past over the years, but I just felt that we've been lacking that real leadership in the defending line. And for me, he gets my two for that. Oh, well, and for his can, performance as well. So, yeah. Yeah. Can I just quickly add? I think him, like him being there, as you said, Tez, in that leadership position, sort of marshaling the defense, sort of also, you know, unlocked for a ba- lack of a better term, Socrates. I thought Socrates was a bit more free in the way he was pressing. Um, you know, of course, he plays left center back more often than not. But with Luis in the team, Socrates switched to the right part, and he was the aggressor yesterday. And I thought he did very well, you know, just sort of freeing himself because he didn't have a Mustafi to look after, that he was a bit more incisive, a bit more aggressive with his touches, with his tackles. And I think that sort of brought the best out of or brought a bit better out of Socrates as well. Yeah, you're probably right there, mate, to be honest. Because, like, it was, it was just it was just great to see that we've actually got somebody there um, who's marching, you know, who's, who's organised and stuff. And we've got this, you know, young Tierney, uh, I don't know if Mafapanis gets a start, and, and you know we've got a young back line apart from Socrates. So, uh, you know, uh, uh, David Luiz, he's going to be a very good asset to have in the team. So, um, Tony, give us your one. I was torn between David Luiz and Aubameyang. I think had Aubameyang played either left or centrally in the first half, I would have probably given it to him. But he was pretty anonymous on the right in the first half. Don't overly blame him for it because we know he's not very good on the right. Um, whereas Louise, for all the reasons you sort of just mentioned, was involved in the whole game. So I'll go him. But as I said, I think I probably would have given it to Aubameyang if he'd have been in his natural position or either of the two natural positions in the first half. But because he wasn't, he only impacted half the game and Louise impacted it all. Okay. So, yeah, Louise. Schwinn, give us your one. I'm going to give to Gwen Doozy for everything that Tony mentioned earlier. I think those are good reasons for him to be number one. Uh, well, get one point, I suppose. Yep, yep. I've got a hate copying you, Kent. I really do. I feel like I'm <laughs> sitting here copying you. But, you know, I, I rattled off, tried to say, you know, try to not copy a Tony last week and give Leno a one, and I wish I didn't, yeah. Um, Leno was pretty good, though, but uh, I often look at the bloke in goals and think, oh, does he deserve one? I'll go Glenn Doozy just for the for you know because he was he was pretty good. You can't deny that. Um, and, and it was good to see that uh, you know it, it's the first time he's he's played alongside um, Sabalos as well. And it was he just seemed you know it was natural like a young bloke and he he wasn't panicking. He he just cruised along and, and did everything right. He did nothing wrong. So. Um, Okay, boys, uh, anything else you want to add on that game, Tony? Or get in some questions? Uh, I mean, the only thing I would say is Lacazette still clearly isn't match fit and hopefully the whatever he got, 65, 70, is enough to get him up to, to match speed. Oh, he done unreal for the goal, but I felt we kind of carried him yesterday. But if that's what it needs to get him up to full fitness, then you've got to say it's, it's brilliant management. But we can't, if he's only at that level again next week, I wouldn't start him at Anfield and I know that's going to be controversial because it's Lacazette but we can't carry players at Anfield and hopefully he's back to full fitness and, and he's sharp and he's link up players as good as it usually is just yesterday it was a bit off but hopefully they were the minutes he needed and Schwinn any last words mate? Yeah, I mean, for one, I was going to bring that up myself, so <clears throat> that, that's very well put by Tony. Just quickly, I'll add that, um, of course, Josh Kroenke was at the stadium yesterday, something that I think we should just mention because I don't think there's a question on that. And uh, we also saw you know, photographs during the rounds on, on Twitter that showed Raul and Edu sort of you know, being outside the ground and interacting with fans, uh, which I thought was a, it was a nice touch, something I thought is worth at least to mention. Okay, sit tight, good people. We'll be back straight after this little ad. In 1957, Laika became the first animal to orbit Earth. What kind of animal was Laika? What is the only team in the Big Four North American Sports Leagues which shares its name with one of the Avengers? And here's one more question for you. Are you the type of person who enjoys playing trivia games, learning new things, and having a bit of fun along the way? If you are, or if you just want to find out the answers to those other questions, then our podcast, Quiz and Hers, might be right up your alley. 
Each week, one of us writes new trivia questions for the other person, covering everything from science to history to pop culture to sports. And every question in a game relates to some theme, like Game of Thrones, internet memes, sandwiches, or animals in space. Some of the themes make more sense than others. So if you like trivia, learning, or real couples testing each other's knowledge and patience, check out our podcast, Quiz and Hers, part of the Big Heads Media Podcast Network. Quiz and Hers, the trivia podcast where we test each other's knowledge and the strength of our relationship. Fuse, Tony, I don't feel like we play out from the back. We just keep playing at the back for most of the time until Burnley press us in our box. How can Burnley have more shots than us? by the end of the first half at the Emirates? I mean, I think it's very unfair to say we don't play out from the back. I think the majority of people would moan that we do it too much, so I can't really comment on that. Um, in terms of them having first shots, uh, more shots, I mean, I, I'm going to assume he's right. I've not looked at it. Um, they definitely didn't have more chances. And also, I think the first half was a bit of a mess because, as I said, Aubameyang is completely wasted on the right. Nelson is playing way too safe. You look at Willock and he's taking chances. He's bursting at people. He's trying to outstrength people. And it's like he's taking his chance, whereas it see, it feels like Nelson is doing nothing wrong, but it feels like he's more scared of losing his place. So he just does everything like 7 out of 10. He plays the safe pass. He takes people on. Like when he had that shot, it was really safe to take the guy on. He was never going to lose that ball going onto his left foot. And that's what the first half was. We had Lacazette, who wasn't sharp. We had Aubameyang, who's useless on the right, and, and Nelson, who was just way too safe. Sabayos was started as a 10, but dropped a lot deeper. So we just didn't make anything in the, in the first half. And I think for me, I know Schwinn said earlier, he doesn't think Pepe starts at Anfield. For me, he has to, because the alternative is, is Nelson, who's just way too timid at the moment. And I know he's not usually like that, but I don't know if he's just trying to prove himself that he can be, uh, they can rely on him, he's responsible. I don't know what it is, but it doesn't make for great viewing and great chance creation. Um, I agree. I think Pepe has to start against Liverpool. You know, we didn't buy this player seventy-five million or eighty million, whatever it cost, um, for him to sit on the bench. So I think you know, top six team, we've got to play him against Liverpool. Um, Sadafi goes on. We only play when we need a goal. Look, you just butt in when you want, Tony. Uh, We only play when we need a goal. Then we do our usual thing of playing in our own half. It's so tendous and boring to watch after the kind of signings we've made this summer. Some of the attacking players, I am happy, we won't, but I still have no clue what exactly Embry Ball is. Um, he goes on and says, I feel like we are hide- we're riding our luck by the calibre of stri- strikers we have. Uh, if we can't carve out Burnley at home, what hope do we have of the rest of the season? Or is it just me who's feeling this way? Thoughts? I mean, for me, like, people are acting like... I know Burnley don't really finish high in the league, but they're not shit. There was a stat before the game yesterday that the only team that Daesh hasn't taken points off since Burnley have been in the Premier League is us. We're the only team that have beat them on, on every occasion. So it's not that he's saying, oh, if we can't even pump Burnley at home or carve them apart. No one does. Like, or they might do it on a one-off, but it's not, it's not regular. We created a lot of a lot of even if they didn't end up in shots and and this is um, I don't really want to get into XG but this is my argument with XG model like you can't say that Aubameyang and Pepe one where Pepe underhill it and, and Aubameyang didn't stride onto it that for me is a great chance but it won't feature in any highlights package or anything because it ended up just being cut out on the edge of the box but there's we created chances Aubameyang had had the one where Pepe put him in where he got the shot off Torreira had one which for me was a world class save by. Pope, so Bios had uh, Pope made a really good save from him. I think I don't know what you expect. We, that, that's five, including the two goals. That's six good chances. Would, like, and they're good, good chances, not just like well, maybe could score. They're six. If they all went in, you would say, oh, I'm not surprised. So I don't know what you want. You want us to be making ten clear and obvious chances every game? It's just not going to happen. It's Premier League football. I, I don't know what people are expecting. And look, this is coming from someone that really isn't an Emery fan. So it's not like I'm just defending it for the sake of because I love Emery. Everyone knows I'm not his biggest fan, but I think you've got to kind of give credit where it's due. I just want to touch on, because I had this same argument with somebody the other day. Um, I'm just trying to find it there. He said about our strikers. uh, We're riding our luck by the calibre of strikers. 
I, I st- I'm starting to get a bit of a feeling, and, and not from, once again, not from Arsenal fans. Look, I talk to a lot of fans. I talk to Spurs fans. I talk to Manchester United, Chelsea fans. They're just, you know, mates in Banner and whatnot. So, and, and they were actually saying very similar, like, um, you boys fucking lucky you've got two of the two of the really probably best strikers right. running around. But it's not luck, is it? I, I was uh, just I about hate- to say, that was my argument. I, I think, like, is that really right? Like, if you actually watch football... What happens when them strikers don't get the fucking ball? Yeah, look, I mean, it's like no one says Barcelona are lucky to have Messi, like, or lucky to have when they had Xavi and Iniesta. That, that's the thing. You pay these money for these good players, and then they're expected to do good things. That's it's kind of how football works. I, I don't, I, I never like in in normal life. It's like when you buy a house and someone goes, "Oh, you're lucky to be on the property ladder." No, I'm not. I worked hard, made money, and I spent it. Like. And it's the same same in football. Arsenal have generated this money, however they've done it, and they've spent it on good footballers, and everyone's shocked that they're doing good things. Like, why why is it lucky that Aubameyang is doing what he's always done? Like, we signed him for that, and now he's doing it at us, but now somehow it's lucky. Yeah, uh, I, I really oh, no. get that. Like, good players do good things. That That is football in a nutshell. Yeah, no, I agree. Um... MWA Gunner says, Schwinn, uh, do you think if Wenger gave in to having a transfer team director of football, etc., a lot earlier, it would have ended, wouldn't have ended as bad as it did? I mean, it's really difficult to say one way or the other definitively. I think what, what I will leave you guys with is that every manager, every executive has their own way of operating. And when they've operated a certain way for, you know, 20 or so or 15 or so years, it's harder for them to evolve. I mean, to, to Wenger's credit, he's he's been someone who's been very open to change and, and has almost, you know, brought about revolution in a lot of ways. But we know this was a sticking point for him. Uh, for what reason? I'm not quite sure. Maybe he knew that he was going to struggle in, in an environment that sort of diluted his power. Uh, at least that's what I would like to believe because we know how much he cared for the club, you know, and I don't think that you know, that's ever going to be questioned. So I wouldn't necessarily say that, yes, it would have been a success and his departure would have been softer, uh, just because I think that everyone has their own styles of, of managing and operating. And, you know, in the absence of that enhanced responsibility, maybe Arsene would have struggled. OK, Tony, this has been flapping around last night or uh, early this morning for me on Twitter after the game. There's, there's been a lot of comments about it. There was people sharing links. Uh, you know, obviously the Van Percy uh, interview that he had on football on BT Sports. I, I thought this may come up in the podcast. Look, you can find the video, guys, that Tony did two years ago, I think. Yeah, so the story's a lot yeah. older, but obviously I only yeah. doing clock in two years ago. So over yeah. two years ago now. Yeah, so, so, so you can find the, 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 the YouTube story on our YouTube account. Uh, give us a subscribe too as well so we're, we're, we're there on the YouTube but Tony's got some great little stories there as well it's a playlist just called short stories so you can actually um, uh, have a listen to a few of them stories uh, Tony uh, the question is what do you make of Van Percy's comments I mean me us three had a discussion about this last night and the Van Percy's now got a role in the English media he's probably going to be covering a lot of games BT have always been accused of, of having an anti-Arsenal bias so I think they're trying to pull it that Van Persie's on the Arsenal side of things so th- this narrative has all come about that nothing that I said everything I said two years ago and um, which I did get untold amount of shit for at the time has pretty much proved to be to be right it's not that they didn't offer him a contract but if I like for example just put it in the context of this podcast if I said to you I want £100,000 a week or I'm not coming on the show anymore and you said, well, we can't do that, so there's no, okay, bye, then I can say, oh, well, they didn't want me anymore. That's, that's basically how it's come about. Like, he's made a load of demands that Arsenal basically said no to, and then he's saying, oh, well, they didn't offer me anything. Well, if I know I can't meet your demands, why am I going to waste my time? Like, he, he's using a small technicality to make himself look like a good guy. Um even and as I said, there, there was an offer on the table before the meeting, and then after, as as we know, he demanded certain things, and they're like, "Look, we can't we can't cater to that." See you later, mate. Basically, but for me, look, it's, for me, it's a load of shit. But as as you said last night, 
people that are, are anti Wenger, Gazidis, or whoever will want to believe it, so they will. And no amount of fact is going to get in the way of that. I mean, and then you've got holograms like you who are catering to it for some apparent reason, which I'm not really sure of. Um, but yeah, it just it's, it's just silly. I honestly don't know why I really give two fucks. <laughs> I just, that, is, I, that is also a bad point, but people still want to no, blame. I know, I got caught up in the moment this morning. <laughs> I was like, fuck, look at this shit. <laughs> I woke up the day and I went, I don't really care. Well, then, no, that is the main point. No one should really care. But you now have, as I said, like, we've seen people on Twitter, that they always hated, well, not always hated Wenger, but hated Wenger for the last five or six years of his tenure, or including these two years. And they're now like, oh, look, see, Wenger done this. And it's like, give it a rest. The bloke's gone. Just get get over it. No amount of either someone loving Wenger or, or someone hating Wenger is going to change anything. So just fucking get over it. I've seen a couple of the boys talk. Look, I'll just, I won't go drag this on too long. I've seen a couple of the boys, uh, Island Boy Gurner, and I think it was Addy discussing in the WhatsApp group, you know, like Addy, Addy made a pretty good point, to be honest, that, uh, you know, if he had a stayed and not signed a contract, and let's say. Just cause, sorry, I know you bring this up last night and I didn't yeah. reply because I was bored of the whole story, but that was never an option. Okay. I don't know. I, no, well, I just let's put it in the context for the Addy's, listeners first. And then I'll get you to... So so what basically the boys were talking about is um, his contract runs up at the end of the season. If he has a good season, what's to stop him if Barcelona say, hey, come over to us, he walks away for free? No, but what what I'm saying is that Addy's whole argument was based on you can't keep him for a year without a contract and let him go right. for free. That was never an option. The options were he, re- he signs on on Arsenal's terms or he goes and he went because... He tried. To, he wanted a deal on his own terms, which was never going to happen. Okay, so yeah, I, I, I partially yeah. listened to Addy's argument because there was about ten voice notes that totaled about twenty-five minutes, and I was tired, so I didn't listen to them, or yeah. not all of them. But from what I gather, his argument was based on a circumstance that didn't ever exist and was never possible. Okay. So you said, "Oh, he could go to Barcelona for free in the next summer." He was never ever going to stay. Never an stay. option. Yeah. yeah. That that he was going that summer, or he was signing a long-term contract. They were the two options. Yeah. Right. Okay. No, that makes sense. Sir. Okay. Um, Sandeep says, oh, let's go Cosman Butter. Schwinn, do any of you miss Granite? I certainly did not. Uh, it's a tough one. Uh, <laughs> we certainly didn't miss him, but does that mean that if he was in the team, we would have been worse, equally good or better? That's really hard to say. I thought, you know, on the day, our midfield was good. I think Willock was probably a weak link, and he was still very good on the day, or you know, as good as we can expect him to be at this point. But I think it'd be it'd be unfair to say that we missed Granit because uh, the midfield sort of won that game for us. You know, we spoke about yeah, yeah, da- yeah. Danny and, yeah. and Guendouzi at length, and and to then say that we missed Granit, I think would be a disservice to the midfield. So I don't think we missed him. Oh, oh look, my biggest point when I've seen a lot of people talking about Granit yesterday and and whatnot. My only point is, is can you play every single game with the team we've currently got that, that ran out on the field yesterday, throw Pepe in, I suppose. Can you play every single game, FA Cup, Europa League, Premier League, every game for the other season with that team? Of course not. No, exactly. So do you, will you miss Granite? You will. You will somewhere along the lines. Um, I mean, but but the argument would be that if you put Granite in this team and you take any one of the midfielders out, can, could that team play every game? No, of, exactly. Of, of uh, this season? Yeah, we, we we need depth, and I think right. I like we've got depth for the midfield. We've got we're talking Granite, we're talking Guendouzi, we're talking Torreira, uh, um, and Sabias. So with you know, like we've got depth, and I like having depth like that going forward. Yeah, I, I'd agree with you. Uh, I'll stick with you for a minute. Schwen Sandeep says Ashley Barnes and Sean Dyke are dickheads. Yeah, I'd agree with that as well. <laughs> I didn't see his press conference yesterday, but I heard a lot of people saying that he was having a good old fucking whinge. Yeah, yeah. I mean, as Tony said, you know, when, when there's a team in the league that's sort of your bogey team and you can never get a number on them, n- not even pick up a point against them, whether home or away, yeah, I mean, you you will become anal and, and sort of single them out. I mean, 
if, if, if he's going to single out our players for quote unquote diving, I didn't really see diving as such. I think our players were clever to, to get contact, you know, get themselves between the ball and the opponent and then fall in, in, in key situations. I'd say that's smart football. I'd argue that kicking players and, and shoving them and, and barging Torreira into Leno as Leno is collecting the ball is, is much more barbaric and, and, and uncultured. So I I throw the question back at Sean Dyche and ask him to, you know, justify those sort of antics as opposed to clever football. Yeah, that's right. He fucking always has in the winch. Uh, Josh. Is the answer. Sorry? Brexit, Brexit, Brexit is the answer. (laughs) They have a proper Brexit football team. To be fair, like match of the day actually summed that up brilliantly yesterday where they said, look, it is a problem in modern football. We all know that. But there was no cases of it yesterday like and it's probably just he came out after the game and needed something to say and as as Schwinn said he's pissed off he's lost again so he's just used probably his thoughts on modern football and attached them to that game even though they didn't really exist mm-hmm. uh, Josh there's definitely positive signs from the game but I'm still concerned about how much space Burnley played players had around the box it seemed like we didn't know who was supposed to be stopping the crosses also, Pepe didn't look like he wanted to defend. Uh, maybe fitness, Tony. I didn't think anyone that played on the wing at any point really fancied defending. And you've also got to remember a large part of Pepe's time on the pitch. He was essentially up front in a 5-3-2 and, and, and floating. Um, I, not up front, but he was floating, so he, wasn't, he didn't really have a defensive duty. But no. I don't think Nelson particularly done his defensive work. I don't think Aubameyang done his defensive work on, on either wing. And usually those players do. So whether it was an instruction that, look, and this is what I said at the start of the season that, or before the season started, that I thought we'd go 4-3-3 three, three with the, the top three having little to no responsibility. Um, I don't know if that's the case, but that's what it looked like yesterday because you'd be very hard-pressed to say Nelson or Aubameyang done their defensive work. I thought in the first half, um, Neil had the freedom of the left wing and he had Aubameyang in front of him who who's known for doing his defensive work when he plays on the wing. And he just didn't. So... I feel that's probably more instruction than than Pepe just not fancying it. Okay, um, we spoke about Sugar Daddy. Says we. Uh, why do you think Chambers was dropped? We did touch on that earlier. Um, M Double A Gunner, do you think VAR is a? I mean, you spoke heavily about this this morning, Tony. Uh, do you think VAR is a good thing for the Man City? Ever since it's been introduced, Man City fans finally have something to complain about. It's like my mate that I go to pretty much every game with. We're on polar opposites. I don't mind it. I would rather the right decision be made as long as it's quick. He fucking hates everything to do with it. Um, he, he wishes it didn't exist. My biggest problem now, and it's I was led to believe that the decisions were going to be shown in the stadium. They're not. So you'd have had Man City fans last night going home and they won't even know why their goal was disallowed. So they wouldn't they in the ground. You're, you're just told decision, no goal. They wouldn't know if someone was offside, if it was handball, which was actually given. Like, that's unacceptable. And I know, I said this to Tez last night, I know as a match-going fan, I'm in the very small minority. And, and most people are sitting at home watching it on TV and they have absolutely no problem with it because they see everything in, in real time. And whether they agree with the decision or not is a different story. Um, but for the match-going fans, it's terrible. And I, and I think, and again... People probably would be like, oh, but you get to go every week. I don't think it's right that the match going fans are completely alienated from what's happening, that you then have to try and get on Twitter quickly while 60 other thousand people are trying to get on Twitter to see why the fuck you haven't just scored a winning goal in the 90th minute. Um, so that's horrendous. But on, on the flip side of that, I, and I said this last week, and I'll probably feel like I'm going to be saying this every week, that my problem is with the rules. VAR is just there to enforce the rules. I mean, that handball rule is an absolute nonsense because never in football has it been one rule for one, apart from the keeper, which is the same on both teams. But now, depending on where you are on the pitch, there's different rules. That has never been the case. And I I hate if football's going to go that way. I don't blame VAR because VAR is just enforcing that rule. My my issue is with the rule. And that's something I think is not going to change whether VAR's there or not. The only issue is without VAR, you probably wouldn't spot them things. That doesn't make the rule right. Just because someone's missed it doesn't mean oh everything's now okay. So I don't I really don't know what the solution is, but that that rule is is for me one of the worst things to happen to football in the last I don't know how many years 20 25 years. 
Yeah, and as May and you discussed last night, mate, that VAR, it's going to be one of them things this this season. It's just going to be very controversial and people are going to complain about it and it's, it's just going to be one of them topics. So, um, you actually said to me that the media were having a bit of a, you know, they were having a bit of a shindig and it's leading the headlines over there as well for those who aren't in, in the UK. So... Um, but again, like again, just to reiterate, all of the talking around in the media is not so much around VAR; it's around that specific rule. Yeah. Okay. Um, it, no one's really criticising VAR apart from that it's highlighting the rule. But again, that makes the rule the problem. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Schwinn had to leave us because he's got things to do. So we'll just mean you'll push it on, mate. Uh, why was Tony at the Arsenal? Why was Tony at Arsenal on media day? I went and wanted to go. It was a couple of years ago. Well, it was a year we signed Lacazette, so. Okay. <laughs> it's a weird question. Um, if you could combine two Arsenal players to make one, which two? There, a few years ago, there would always be players would be like, oh, Giroud and Walcott. And, and, but now it doesn't really seem like there's anyone. I mean, I'd put Granite's passing range in someone quicker, probably. Um, yeah, it's probably a good shout. I mean, yeah, if you could give, say, Willock Xhaka's passing range, then there'd be pretty much nothing he couldn't do. Mm. Yeah, he was, he was good yesterday too. We didn't really talk about yeah, him. Yeah, he was. I felt, I felt it was probably a bit unfair that we didn't really mention him, but mm. he wasn't stand out. As I said, he wasn't in the top one, two or three for any of us, but probably fourth. So it seemed a bit unfair that we didn't mention him. And it shows that now it's kind of the level we come to expect from him because before you'd go, oh, he done really well for an 18, 19 year old. But now it's like, even though it's only been a couple of games, we now just expect that from him. Yeah. Yeah. No, he's good. He's good. Um, I, I, I know it's early, but in your opinion, what's our best midfield? Too early for me. Yeah. Uh, look, I, I don't think there's such a thing. I think it's horses for courses. You can't tell me a team that's going to be on the back foot the whole time against say Liverpool away is going to have the same best midfield as you are when you're going to have 90% of the ball at home to Sheffield United or whoever so I think it is all depends on the game uh, Why should we play Ozil and Sabias in the easier games like how Santi was used with with Wenger or should we should we play Ozil and Sabias? Yeah, I mean, it'd be something that'd be very interesting to see. Uh, I think it's something I would like to see given a chance. Um, but then there's a lot of combinations I'd like to see. So, yeah, I think there'll be one more so, I think. Definitely one more so. Um, MWA Gunner, if, if it's true that we'll go for <laughs> Open Kano, Open Kano, Open Kano in, in January. Uh, and we end up getting him, would you st- still be Cronky out or wouldn't you mind him staying since he sorted out the structure of the club? I mean, I've never fully been on board with the, the Cronky out bandwagon anyway. So nah, me I, I, look, I, I, my, my stance with him was always, I'm not saying he's the best person on earth, but I don't really get all the Cronky out, mainly because I thought it was pointless. About, I mean, I've said many times that if someone tells me that they don't like the way I decorated my house, that don't mean they can make me sell it, which is pretty much what Arsenal fans were, were asking for with Cronky. But, yeah, I mean, I've never been out and out Cronky out, to use the expression anyway. Mm, my, no, my over. Um, and, uh, no point in asking MWA Gunner, Will Shear Ramsey, who's going to be captain, because none of them are at the club, mate. Um, uh, Halls of Marbles. Jack Ron Ramshear. Sorry? Jack Ron Ramshear. <laughs> is there any reason for a heart for the hard insistence on playing out from the back? Is Abemian growing into his wide form number nine role now? His goal was uh, uh, rem- uh, well, he's, he's reminiscence of Henry's strike in how he cut it back in. Um. Look, as I said, I thought Aubameyang was really good when he played on the left and, and then after when Lacazette went off when he played centrally. I thought he was terrible on the right. Not oh, Terrible, he just wasn't involved. Uh, I think a lot of the reason we play out from the back is, look, we're playing Burnley, who pretty much play four big players at the back. So anywhere across the back line, you're not really going to win any long balls. We had Lacazette, who's 
what five foot nine and wasn't fit. Aubameyang, who just doesn't really have much interest in winning headers versus centre backs. So what do you gain by going long? They win the ball back and they head it, and then you have a fight in midfield. At least that the way playing short, we have some form of control. And again, I said this earlier. I think based on yesterday, playing out from the back is getting a hell of a lot of criticism. I don't think we really made any errors. Nothing like, especially nothing huge. I don't know the, the feeling I get, and I don't know if this is right. Is that the commentators kept banging on about it? So it's worried people. Like the commentators going, "Oh, Arsenal made had a risk, like, been a bit risky there." So then that's stuck in people's heads, and now people keep talking about it because the start of the game where I'm blessed with having no commentary, and I say blessed. I didn't really see any issue. Um, yes, sorry, I was, I was reading the bloody uh, WhatsApp messages. Um, I thought Maddie threw us a couple of questions there. That was all. Uh, Halls of Marbles talking about the BT Sports interview with Van Percy thing was interesting, but it's not the fact. He wanted the leave to win, which he did ultimately. It's it's that he it's what he said. Arsenal was a small stepping stone. And the little boy inside him was always a Man U fan. Trying to pin it, pin it on the club doesn't excuse that. Spawn. Um, Vish says, "Can we find a more defensive mind, a tough tackling, powerful clone version of Sabias in January?" Uh, Sabias was immense yesterday. Can Arsenal make his loan permanent deal right now? I will still maintain, and I don't think this will happen, but. Remember Mkhitaryan's first home game. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, let's just look. I, I'm, I, I, I get the excitement. He was really good. Oh no, I tweeted last happened. night. I love him. Yeah. But just, just remember, like, keep it in our heads that it, it was one very, very impressive game. But Mkhitaryan's home debut, we won five one, and he got three assists. So mm. let's just calm ourselves for a little. Um, Hack on Larson's got a couple of questions. Uh, what do you think is our best midfield, a 4 3 3, and in a 4 2 3 1 formation? Similar to whoever asked the question earlier, I think it all completely depends on who we're playing. Uh, MWA did ask earlier. Um, Hack on, what do you think about our midfield three yesterday? From now, it's about to find the balance with the two players. Play Sabias. Uh, Sabias was immense and made everything tick in our midfield. Yeah, I mean, look, yesterday the balance was very good. You had Guendouzi, who keeps the ball ticking over very well. You had Ceballos, who plays forward and gets himself out of tight spaces. And you had Willock, who is a bit of a sort of power runner, or as a runner, who's the box-to-box, who's the engine. So it worked pretty well. You have to find that balance. Amongst the three, I said this last week, that... Amongst the three, you need a broad set of skills. And the problem with playing a two is unless one of them players is incredible, it's very difficult because you're not going to get all of the bases covered that you need. Uh, it's not to say, look, Xhaka could probably come in and do, say, Guendouzi's role, but then you might need Torreira to do more of the defensive and then someone else to be more creative. As long as you find the balance amongst the three, that, that's the key point. Um, yeah, look, and I'm just going to go into this other my biggest problem yesterday with this with Sabias, and Hakon just says now, did any of our players have a particular bad game? I, I to be honest, I was watching him so much, I didn't, I, I did notice the other players, but he was just, he was everywhere and and just doing everything right, and I think I was so like, wow, look at this kid go. Um, I wasn't really paying attention to. Who was having a bad game? And I, I don't think anybody did, but nobody stuck out to me like a sore thumb. If yeah, any, me, if I anything, like, if stuff. anything, yeah. Well, sorry. If anything, it would be more. The only thing I was a bit pissed off about is the amount of space Burnley had with them long balls. But that's Burnley, and they're probably going to do that anyway. I don't know if that's how you stop that. Yeah, I mean it's difficult because the ball's going over your head. You can't mark the sky. Basically. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I mean, what you were saying about him te- like him stealing the show and him catching your eye, that's what I said when we was going on our 3-2-1s. It's like, I wouldn't have been surprised if we all obviously gave Sabayas three, and then we didn't in the end. We all went the same, but with different scores. But I wouldn't have been surprised if we went with six different players with our two and ones because he was just that far ahead that it was almost like everyone else was kind of like just an also part in the Sabayas show. Yeah, yeah, no, I totally agree, totally agree. 
Um, Hakon says six points of six is a perfect start, particularly when we're missing players and have a lot of players coming back to fitness. Some brilliant football and some not so brilliant, but all that matters is those points. Uh, how, yep. many, how many times does Dyke uh, Dyche accuse for diving? So it's pretty much, pretty much every single game. Hakon says, what a fuck with. Um, MWA Gunner, to be honest, that game deserved to be a draw. Ooh, here we go, here we go. Uh, we allowed Burnley to have more chances than us and hardly created much ourselves. Only two pieces of individual brilliance got us out, which was the story of last season. Should we be worried? I disagree with every single bit of that question. Well, look, I, I, I do too. But somebody else up further asked something about it was similar. You know, that the, was the first question we said. And there's a little glimpses of negativity coming in. Like Hakon said, we got six points out of two games, boys. And I see little bits of, unless you're just trying to ask a question and change the topic, but I think it's a good start. I think in Close. two games, yeah. like players coming well, back. You can have his six points. That yeah. is the most you Exactly. Yeah. I've got, I'm not saying we played perfectly and we've been amazing, but we we've, we've not really completely clicked, and and we've got six points. I agree. We could could have created both ch- more chances in both games, but to say Burnley had more for me is is ridiculous. Like I said to Schwinn last night, and he looked at the stats, and I can't even remember what he told me. But did they have a shot on target apart from the goal? I, I literally can't remember. Yeah, they, they, they had they had a couple. Um and. and well, I can't remember making him a save. And when I say, again, uh, anyone that listens regularly will know this, like my definition of a shot on target that I actually care about is one that the average bloke in the street wouldn't save. So if they've, if they've had four shots on target, one is the goal, and then they've had three that Leno's caught that he could have done with a cup of tea in his other hand. For me, like how, what chance? Like I can name you Arsenal chances that we had. I can't name a single Burnley where they threatened the goal. Like you can Actually, go through and yeah, made a great right. save from Terreri, made a good save from Aubameyang. The Pepe incident we spoke about where he put um, Aubameyang through but maybe not hard enough mm. um, and, and Aubameyang tried to look back for him. Like they're great chances and great moments. The Sabayoff shot, Pepe made a really good, I mean Pope, sorry, made a really good save. With them, what chances? If you're telling me they had, no, you've but, now got seven chances as good yeah, as that. Yeah, I I, I, look, I haven't looked at the stats on how many shots they've had on the target and stuff either. But I think there was a couple, and um, somebody may correct me, from corners and set pieces. And there, there was a couple, I'm sure there was a couple from set pieces um, on target and uh, where, he, where Leno made a few saves. But, there was, but you're right, there was nothing like a... Like a flashy, flashy run, and like an Bambi Yang and things like that. It doesn't. It doesn't have to be flashy. A chance is a chance, but there's no way I could, from what I've seen and I've seen the highlights as well, I could come out of that and go, "Geez, look at the chances Burnley had. Like they had more than us. Never, never in a million years could I say that." Well, according, uh, yeah. So according to the stats, they had nine off, five on, and I, I wouldn't have thought it would be five. On target, we had nine chance, nine shots on target. Yeah, that'd yeah, be, but I mean, there's stuff be. like it's, look, again, stuff like Nelson's, where I mean, Pope's spilt it and done quite. I mean, it was poor to spill it, mm. but that's obviously a shot on target. For me, that doesn't really count in what I class as it because I think any normal man would say that. But as I said, my, my point goes, we, I can list off chances. Even watching the highlights last night, I watched Match of the Day last night, and I don't think they showed Leno make a save. Mm, I think there was one late with McNeil. It was off a corner, something with Rodriguez. There was one. There was a couple like that. They, but they didn't show Leno make a save on, on Match yeah, of the Day. Yeah, okay. No, no, fair enough. There was a couple I thought there was anyway. Um, anyway. Let's move on. Monreal with very good performance, says Hakon Larson. Uh, Maitland Niles was decent defending, but was very quiet going forward. Expect more from him playing at home against Burnley. Okay. Again, I, I think this comes down to where they, what I believe has happened, and this may be absolute bullshit. I'm not saying it's fact, but where I believe that they've told the front three, your attackers just attack, they've probably said to the defender fullbacks, 
well, you kind of don't have to go forward as much anymore because these guys aren't chasing back with you. It, it's, it's what's known as cheating. So you're cheating your defensive duties. And if, if the attackers are doing that, then the, the defenders don't need to bomb on as much. Like even Monreal didn't. I know he nearly got an assist if he was on side, but he didn't get forward anywhere near as much as we used to used to see him from him. Um, and and I agree, Maitland-Niles didn't get as forward as much as we'd expect. But I think that's a change in approach. I don't think that's anything to do with the players. Mm. Uh, Vish says we were sitting uh, sitting deep at home, letting Burnley attack us. Uh, insanity as a trial run for Liverpool next week can Emery use our performance to analyse how best to set up our midfield next week for the onslaught of their front three Uh, who would you sacrifice well look I I watched their game against Southampton last night that was on after yeah yeah. Yeah. look and I know they played midweek during the week with that game against Chelsea but I don't think they were that great, Liverpool yesterday. I think they were no. let off very, all three times. Oh, very lucky. Yeah, all three times I've seen them this season. So in all their three games they've played, they've been very well, quite well, very open at the back. They've conceded in all of the games, uh, which I think if you look at the amount of goals they conceded last season, it was it was much less than one a game. So to to concede one, two, and then one in the three consecutive games, they. I don't know what it is, whether they're not 100% clicked into gear yet or if they're just more open for another reason, but they don't look they don't look as hard to score against. Mm, I'd uh, rather play in this, this I'd rather play in like this you know, this early two in the season because, yeah uh, and if you're a Southampton fan, and I know you all aren't because you're all Arsenal fans, but jeez, you'd be fucking livid um, I can't remember who the uh, it wasn't Red uh, who, who Danny were, yeah, Danny. did you see that? Yeah how did he miss that, mate? We'd be fucking ropeable if Lacazette or Birmingham, you know, missed that. That was a fucking good yeah. chance. So, you know, could have levelled it up at 2-2, but I almost thought Southampton were unlucky not to steal the win. And more so, Liverpool were lucky to get the win. Um, uh, Sue Shant says our defence still looks very shaky. Uh, Till Tierney, Bellerin returns. Uh, what can Emery do to improve the defence other than praying? Well, look, you've got half the people moaning that the fullbacks didn't attack in the way that they would expect, and then other people saying, what can he do? I think that's what he has done, and I don't think we looked any... Look, I'm not saying we were perfect at the back, we obviously weren't, but I don't think we're anywhere near as shaky or as suspect as I've seen us at times last season, or in the last few seasons. Uh, again, I always say defence comes down to system, and I, I think that the system worked better yesterday defensively, in a defensive way. Uh, did it it, did it tame our attack a little bit? Yeah, probably. But you can't have both. You can't be the most free-flowing attacking team in the world and then have a rock-solid defence. It just doesn't really have to work like that. Mm. So, I don't, look, I think we would probably look a bit tight. Nothing against Guendouzi. As it, uh, you heard me give him the second-best player, our second-best player. But if you want us to be a little bit tighter, you probably put Torreira. He was the deepest of the midfielders, and you probably put Torreira in there, who is more defensive-minded. But then he doesn't use the ball as well. So you're you're taking with one hand your possession, but giving with the other hand more defensive stability, and it's it's about finding that balance. Mm-hmm. Um, how do you rate Willock and Niles' performance? Gwen Doozy was superb yesterday too. Sushant says uh, we touched on Willock. Um, we probably didn't speak much about him, but we we did acknowledge that he was really good. Uh, Maitland Niles, where do you think he went? Well, look, I, I think he the Barnes is their most difficult player to play against, but their best player for me is Dwight McNeil. And he didn't really do anything. I know the goal obviously came from his deflected shot, but Maitland-Niles was tracking the runner, so that was nothing to do with Maitland-Niles. So I I think you've kind of got to give Maitland-Niles credit. While it didn't look like he played amazing, if you've kept their best or most dangerous player out of the game, well done. Whether that's down to him or down to the rest of the team, I I can't criticise him when their best player has has not really made an impact. or You know what I mean? Mm. Whether he's their best or most dangerous, however you want to label it. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, look, it's, he's pretty good. Uh, why is the Vermeer not appreciated by our fan base like Lacazette? And that is the million dollar question that we've been asking for two seasons. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> uh, hack on quick look, a couple of last quick questions. Who asked that, by the way? Uh, Sushant. Oh, okay. Uh, hack on just said Gwendozi had a brilliant game as well, to be fair. Um, just running through, there was a couple of notifications, so I just thought I'd have a quick look. 
That's about it, mate. That's about us done and dusted. Um, look, we've got a bolt, we've got a run. Tony's got to get somewhere. Schwinn's already gone, and I've also got a bolt, so I know it is a shorter just, podcast than usual. Just very yeah. quickly, before Schwinn left, he done a Liverpool prediction of 2 2, and he said that he thinks we'll play a back three. Okay, okay. Oh, yeah, because we're not going to be on before then, are we? Nah. Shit, so I'll go do a prediction on, on the spot. Go on then. <laughs> Um, okay. <laughs> I, was, I, was, uh, I don't know really I was thinking um, No I was thinking if Pepe starts I, I would be tempted to be I think it might be a high scoring game And uh, and that's because You know we, we, we're a bit leaky I think they're a bit leaky I'm, I'm going to go like a 3-2 to Arsenal um, I know it's probably a bit of a stretch But I'm thinking there'll be a few goals in this one So yeah I'll go I'll go 3-2 Arsenal um, Back 4 or 5? <sighs> Probably back four, I think. I think, yeah. No, you'll go back five. It'll be back five. I, I, obviously, I'm not going to do a score prediction, but I think he'll go back four. Back four? No. Yeah. I don't know, because he was testing things out during that game So yesterday, so I don't know whether he's come out of that game and thought, oh... You know, what, I don't know what whether he's found the right ingredient too. Like he was testing. I, I, I personally think that the back five did help because he was probably expecting them to win the flick ons, and then at least we've got the extra man. But also, with Lacazette had to come off, the options were Martinelli for twenty minutes against Burnley, which is never going to be a good idea, mm. or Kalasnac, which then automatically kind of made it a back five. And it wasn't. Re- it was weird. Like a few people, I went with uh, uh, for drinks with some friends after the game. And we're saying it was a weird back five because it was like Kolasinac was still kind of playing as high up as Aubameyang was when he was on the left, but but Monreal tucked in. So it's like we played three centre-backs and, yeah, and no weird. left wing back. Yeah. It was really weird. I'd love to see the average position to see if that is what actually happened, but that's what it looked like when we was there. It wasn't. I thought that, but I didn't really say anything. And then two of my friends who sat completely different places in the ground, one sat upper tier, another one sat behind the goal, and I'm sat on the halfway line, so our viewpoints are all completely different. Mm. All said the same thing, that it was really like, it wasn't a formation. Yeah, no, it, it, was, it, it was weird. It was, yeah, it was hard to work out what he was doing as well. And I was watching on TV. I think the commentators at one stage said it was uh, two at the top, two and a three at the back. And I'm like, I don't, I don't Yeah, know. I mean, look, it was definitely three centre-backs and then Maitland-Niles was a right wing-back. Yeah. But then Snatch was kind of like, High up on the left, but, or, or higher up than you'd expect the wing back to be, but not quite as high up as you'd expect the, when Aubameyang was doing that job. Yeah. So it was, I'm not saying it was wrong, this is not a criticism, yeah, but yeah, it yeah. wasn't a, a, a natural out and out what you'd expect the normal back five to be. Mm-hmm. Nah, okay. Um, yeah, so that's, I don't know, we'll see what happens. I, I don't know what, how he's thinking at the end of the game. I haven't seen an Emory press conference and that yet. I know I'm a bit slack, but. Um, I just imagine he'd say it was a good game, blah, blah, blah. Um, okay, mate, that's about us. We're going to wrap it up. Uh, oh, so just a quick shout-out to our Patreon listeners. Um, we've got a f- getting a few up there now, so thank you very much to you guys, and we'll keep rolling that content out for you guys in bonus content and things. We'll also uh, – we won't have time this week, but usually Tony Schwinn and I talk and dribble shit after every podcast for about half an hour or so. Um, so what I'll do is I'll actually throw that uh, whole podcast up as well. Um, I'll start recording them and throw them up, and you can just see what we dribble about. And that's only for Patreon listeners only because you are all excellent people. Not saying that you normal people aren't, but the Patreon listeners are great because they actually support us in what we do, So, and we thank you very much for that. So, um, Okay, mate, that's about it for you. Anything else? Yep. Well, good. Okay, thank you. Um, everybody, get your tips in to me. Try and get them in early, eh? Uh, don't, don't leave it to the last game, the Liverpool game. So get them tips in to me at Guna Tez. Um, happy days, good luck, and thank you. Good night. See you, mate. See you later.